بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد رسول الله I begin with the name of Allah. All praise belongs to Allah. And may peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad for he is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. So we've been talking about the prayer, all the integrals, all the recommendations, the conditions. Now, as we know, the Muslims, they don't always pray by themselves. And that's what we're going to talk about in this lesson, the group prayer. In Arabic, the group prayer is called Salatul Jama'a, not to be confused with Jum'a. That's a separate prayer on its own. That is the Friday prayer. Now, what is the group prayer? Essentially, this consists of one imam who is leading at least one person in the prayer. At a bare minimum, that's two people. That would be considered a group prayer. It is a communal obligation what we called a long time ago, the Fard Kifaya. It's communally obligatory for the Muslims in a given locality to establish the group prayer for the five daily prayers. Fajr, Duhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. If some people in the community do this group prayer for the five daily prayers, that is sufficient for the entire Muslim community. For example, there is a masjid. The masjid is open for the five daily prayers. If that is done and that's made public, the entire Muslim community is absolved from doing this. Alhamdulillah. Now, with that said, the reward of attending the group prayer is immense. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he said, the group prayer is superior to the prayer done alone by 27 ranks. Which is to say, if you pray in a group, that is 27 times more superior than praying by yourself. And so there is immense reward in praying as a group, although not every single Muslim has to attend this group prayer. Now, the group prayer, Salatul Jama'a, it has its etiquettes. Each person has a role in this group prayer, and we're going to talk about some details of what the Imam should do, what the followers should do. So, etiquettes of the Imam. The imam who's leading the group prayer, he's encouraged to keep his recitation brief. You are leading the prayer. You are encouraged to recite a short surah, relatively speaking. It all depends on your recitation abilities. But generally, keep it short. What is this based on? The Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he once chastised a person who led a very long fajr prayer. He said, there are sick people in the congregation. They are elderly people. There are people who have things to do. Why are you praying so long? Keep it brief. Now, let's say the imam leads the prayer. He says the salam to end the prayer at the end. What does he do afterwards? It is sunnah for the imam to remain sitting and to turn his right side to the congregation and his left side is facing the qibla. So he turns to the side. Right side facing the followers, left side facing the Qibla. And then he can recite any supplication quietly to himself. So those are the etiquettes of the Imam. Some more specifics. In the Shafi'i school, a woman cannot lead a man. Why not? Because we're human beings, we have common sense, there are issues of decency when it comes to a woman standing before a man. We don't have to explain this. We don't have to list this out. We're all human beings. So a woman cannot lead a man in prayer, but a woman can lead other women in prayer. Let's say there's a group of women and they want to pray dhuhr. They can designate one female imam to lead all the women. Perfectly fine in the Shafi'i school. And historically this was done, but it was done at home. So historically, men would go to the masjid, pray in congregation. Women would stay home. Why not pray in congregation as well? Again, the prayer in a group is 27 times more superior than a prayer done alone. So all the women would line up. One female imam leads the prayer. Alhamdulillah. Perfectly fine. So those are the etiquettes of the imam. Some etiquettes of the follower, the person behind the imam who is following him in prayer. The follower cannot be closer to the Qibla than the Imam. 
the follower cannot be closer to the Qibla than the Imam, which means the follower's heels cannot be ahead of the Imam's heels. It's sunnah, it's recommended for the person to be behind the Imam, even if slightly, even if slightly. Although if the Imam and the follower are standing in the same row right next to each other, the prayer remains valid. It's just that the follower can't be closer to the Qibla than the Imam because he's following him after all. Now, here is something interesting to note. And we talked about this when we talked about the intercourse of the prayer. Every single individual in the prayer must recite Surah Al-Fatiha in every rakah, whether he's the Imam, whether he's the follower. Every single person in that prayer has to recite Surah Al-Fatiha for his prayer to be valid. This is something that's particular to the Shafi'i school. So what does this look like practically speaking? Let's say that it is Fajr and the Imam is reciting Surah Al-Fatiha out loud. After he's done with his recitation, every single follower in that group prayer has to recite Surah Al-Fatiha to himself. Again, not loudly, not to disturb other people, but loud enough that you can hear yourself. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, all the way to the end of the surah. Every single person has to do this, and if they don't do it, their prayer is not considered valid in the Shafi school. And historically, in Shafi localities, in places where people knowingly follow the Shafi school, the Imam would recite Surah Al Fatiha, and when he's done, he would stop. He would pause momentarily, giving everybody behind him the time to recite Surah Al Fatiha on his own. This is in historical Shafi localities. Fajr, Maghrib, Isha, and Jummah prayer as well. The Imam recites Surah Al Fatiha. After he's done, you recite Surah Al Fatiha to yourself. Now, if you think that the imam, his recitation is so fast that I'm not going to have time to recite Surah Al-Fatiha after him. Like he's going to say Surah Al-Fatiha, he's going to say a very short surah, and then it's time for ruku. I'm not going to have time to recite Surah Al-Fatiha after him. What do you do? It's perfectly fine for you to recite Surah Al-Fatiha at the same time he's reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. Again, he's doing it loudly. You're doing it quietly so you're not disturbing people. Enough that you can hear yourself. And that's very, very quiet. This is perfectly fine as well. Now, let's say you join the prayer and they already started. You're the follower. They've already started. Before you enter the prayer, you have to say Allahu Akbar while standing. While standing. So let's say the group is in sujood. Before you join the prayer, you have to stand up and say Allahu Akbar, then do sujood. To join the prayer. You can't do sujood and say Allahu Akbar. That's not how you start the prayer. You stand up, Allahu Akbar, go into sujood. Or whatever current position the group is in. Any raka that you've missed as a latecomer to the prayer, you have to make them up after the prayer is done. After the prayer is done, you stand back up and you perform the remainder of the prayer that you missed. The imam will say the salam and the prayer, you stand back up, you finish how many ever raka you had missed. So those are the etiquettes of the follower. Etiquettes between the imam and the follower. As a follower, just by the term itself, you follow the imam. You follow his movements. Ideally, you should wait a moment. He bows, then you bow after him. You let him do it, then you do it right after him. You are the follower after all. Now, here is something interesting to note. The follower, he must intend to follow the imam in the group prayer, meaning he makes the niyyah. You as the follower have to have the intention to follow the imam. And as we noted in the past lessons, you don't have to actually say anything. You just have to have the cognition that I'm following him in the prayer. If he does a very long ruku, I do a very long ruku. If he does a very long sujood, I do a very long sujood. Whatever he does, I'm doing. That is the intention of the follower. But the imam himself doesn't have to have the intention to lead the prayer. This is a very interesting point. What does this mean? This means that if someone's praying by himself, you walk into the masjid, someone is praying. You can designate that person to become the imam of a prayer. That person started his prayer, he's by himself. He's not intending anything of being the imam. You can go up behind him, 
tap him on the shoulder, indicating to him, I'm following you now. And then you stand behind him, or right next to him, slightly behind him. And at that moment, he should get the hint that, okay, I'm the imam now. And then he starts leading the prayer. Maybe he was saying Allahu Akbar to himself silently, quietly. Now he has to say loud enough that you can hear him because he's leading the prayer now. So it's a very interesting nuance. Again, this doesn't happen too often, but it does happen. You can be in the masjid, praying by yourself. Someone comes behind you, taps you on the shoulder as to indicate you are the imam now. I'm following you. You didn't have that intention when you started the prayer, but you're the imam anyway. And what's interesting is that it doesn't matter what prayer you're praying. It doesn't matter what prayer the follower is praying. Let's say you are doing two rakah of a sunnah prayer. The follower, he has the intention to pray four rakah of dhuhr, which is fard. You are doing two for sunnah. He's doing four for dhuhr. It's perfectly fine. Your prayer is still connected. After you're done with your two rakah, he will just continue and do two more rakah for his dhuhr. So you don't have to be praying the exact same prayer. That's a very interesting point in the Shafi school. Both of your prayers are valid, even if it's two separate prayers that you're praying, but they overlap with the imam and the follower. Another interesting thing. At any moment, the follower, he can interrupt his following of the imam. And then he finishes the rest of the prayer on his own. So let's say, the imam is praying duhr. I'm praying duhr too. And in the middle of the prayer, I intend to myself, I'm going to finish the rest of the prayer by myself. Perfectly fine to do. Perfectly fine to do. Although the scholars, they say, this is disliked. This is makru. It's better that you don't do it. Unless you have a valid excuse. So for example, let's say you're following the imam and in the middle of prayer, you start feeling sick. Like I, I might just pass out now. I don't want to pass out and faint in the middle of a prayer. So I break my prayer following him. I do my own prayer for the remainder and I do it very quickly so I can go to the bathroom, for example. That is a valid excuse. Or let's say you have to attend to a pressing matter. Something important comes to your mind. Oh no, did I leave the stove on at home? I have to rush home. Perfectly fine for you to break. Do your quick prayer. Imam is still going on. You do your quick prayer, you go home. So what you see here in the Shafi school, the imam and the follower, the relationship is very flexible. Person's praying, you can appoint him to be the imam, even if he didn't have the intention to begin with. You're the imam now. Or the follower can say, you know what? I don't want to follow you anymore. I break off. I finish my prayer. Imam is still praying. That's perfectly fine. Alhamdulillah. So those are the etiquettes of the imam of the follower, the imam and the follower. There are some etiquettes when it comes to forming prayer roles, what's called the saf, the prayer role, or plural sufuf, the prayer roles, the prayer lines, you can say. If the imam and one follower are praying, it's sunnah for the follower to stand on the imam's right side. So the imam is standing, the follower is right behind him, right next to him, you can say, but slightly behind him, on the right side. That is sunnah, that is recommended. If someone else joins the prayer, there's another follower now, there's two followers. What will happen is the second follower will tap the first person on the shoulder, indicating I'm joining, and the follower can now step back, and now the imam has his own little prayer row by himself, and the two followers are behind him in their own prayer row. Essentially, they're forming a new prayer row. So that is the sunnah when you have the imam and one follower, and then someone else joins. Now, here is an interesting point. Let's say you are praying in the second row, and there's a gap in the row before you. The first row, there's a gap that appears. Maybe someone in the mid-prayer, he had to go. He had to, maybe he broke his wudu. Allah Ta'ala knows best. There's a gap. You want to fill the gap. What do you do? This is what you do. You are in the second row. You step forward with one foot. Let's say it's your right foot. You step forward with your right foot. Then you follow through with the left foot so that the two feet are in a line. They're next to each other. And you pause for a second. And then you do it again. 
Right foot, left foot, pause for a second. Right foot, left foot, pause for a second. Why are you doing this? If you remember the conditions of the prayer, Shuruto Soleh, one of the conditions is that you avoid extraneous movement. If the gap is before you and you just walk up to the gap, take one step, next step, one step, next step, you've broken your prayer by doing this. This is excessive movement. So to avoid that, what you do is take one step, you pause for a second, you do this again. Pause for a second, do this again, as long as it takes. By breaking it up like this, you're not walking. And this is something to note because some people, unfortunately, they get this wrong sometimes. Alhamdulillah. And so that is that. These are the etiquettes of the prayer. Now, let's look at what Imam an says about this. He says, May Allah Ta'ala have mercy on him. And as for the group prayer, Al-Jama'ah, other than the Friday congregational prayer, what's called Al-Jumu'ah. Some people say Al-Jumu'ah, some people say Al-Jumu'ah. They put two dhammas, perfectly fine either way. So we're not talking about the Friday prayer. That is its own subject. We're going to talk about that in a later lesson, inshallah ta'ala. We're talking about the group prayer for Fajr or Dhuhr, Asr or Maghrib or Isha. It is a communal obligation. Fard kifaya. We talked about this. Some people in the community need to do this group prayer for each of the five daily prayers. As long as two, three, four, a small group of people do this in the community, everybody is let off the hook. Alhamdulillah. So, what else does Imam al say? Rahmatullahi alayhi. May Allah ta'ala have mercy on him. The follower must make the intention to perform it, but not the imam. We talked about this. The follower can appoint someone to be the imam, even if the person didn't intend to be the imam when he started the prayer. So the follower must have the intention to perform a group prayer. The imam, it could be sort of imposed upon him. He didn't have to have the intention when he began the prayer. The follower must not advance in front of the imam, meaning he mustn't be closer to the qibla than the imam himself. He must be aware of the imam's prayer by seeing or hearing him. So we didn't talk about this, but this is fairly obvious. If you're following an imam, you have to know what he's doing. You have to know what he's doing. And this can be done by seeing him. Let's say you're in the, the first row. You're seeing the imam bowing and standing in sujood and so on and so forth. You know what he's doing. You're following him. But let's say you're very far away from him. Let's say you're like in the fifth row. Or maybe you're in a completely different floor. Maybe he's on the first floor. You're in the basement. But you can hear him. That's perfectly fine. You hear him say, Allahu Akbar. You hear him say, Allahu liman hamida. You hear all the things he's doing so you can follow him. What Imam al is saying is simply that you have to be aware of the Imam's prayer. Because otherwise, how are you following him? If you can't see him, if you can't hear him, how do you know what he's doing? So in order to follow him, you have to follow him, essentially. And then he mentions a sub-point to that. If the follower is not in the mosque, though the imam is in the mosque, he must draw close to the imam without a barrier between them. Very s subtle point, but essentially he's saying the same thing. If the imam is in the mosque, and let's say it's a very small mosque, and because there's so many prayer rows, you are outside of the mosque. You're still praying, you're still following the imam you still have to be able to either see him or hear him. That's what he's saying. So if there's a wall between you and the imam and you can't see him or even hear him anymore, then you're not following him anymore. And practically speaking, let's say you have the imam in the masjid and you are like in the seventh row. This is a very big prayer. Seventh row. You probably can't see the imam anymore. But you can see the people in front of you. That's perfectly fine as well. So if the people in front of you are going into ruku, you can safely assume that the imam went into ruku as well. So it's like you can't see the imam, you can't hear him anymore, but I can see the people in front of me. And obviously they're following the imam too. So these are like subtle points, but something that the, uh, the fuqaha, the, uh, the jurists, they mention. Alhamdulillah. Now, Imam Nawawi, rahmatullahi alayhi, may Allah ta'ala have mercy on him, he says one interesting thing here. A boy, what they call 
Sobi. He may lead an adult in prayer. Very interesting. You don't see this too often, but it could happen. Let's say you have a little boy who's maybe nine years old, but maybe he's a hafiz of the Quran. He has memorized the entire Quran. Some communities, they say, you are the hafiz, you're leading the prayers, even if you're a boy. The followers behind you are all men. You are a boy, perfectly fine in the Shafi school for this to happen. doesn't happen too often. In fact, some of the Shafi scholars, they say this is makruh, this is disliked. Because generally speaking, the leader of the community should be a man, not a little boy, you see. But if this is ever a situation, perfectly fine. A little boy, if he knows more Quran than everybody in the vicinity, he can lead the prayer. However, a woman may not lead a man in prayer. We talked about this. A woman cannot lead a man, but a woman can lead other women in prayer, in group prayer. Nor can an unlettered person, an unlettered person, what's called the ummi, here this refers to someone who can't recite Surah Al-Fatiha properly. So let's say there's a person in the community, he can't recite the letters of Surah Al-Fatiha properly. Maybe he's a new convert, for example. Or maybe he has such a strong accent that he can't pronounce the Dawd properly, or the Ayn properly. They say that this person shouldn't lead someone in prayer who knows how to recite it properly. That's what this is saying. So someone who can't recite the Quran properly, he shouldn't lead people who can. And this is, again, sort of common sense. When you go into the masjid, usually the imam is already designated. But things like this happen from time to time. So this is why the, uh, the Shafi scholars mentioned this. Alhamdulillah. So that is that. All the rules regarding the group prayer, the etiquettes of the imam, and the follower. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ala ushabihi wa ala atba'ihi hatta yamal qiyamati wa salam tasliman kathira.